Hello, everybody. Roll call. Juliet Ballard. Marta Larson. Um, I'm present, participating from Northfield Township, Michigan. Marie Gress. Uh, present, calling in from Hocking Hills, Ohio. Oh. Margaret Reynolds. Uh, present, calling in from Pittsfield Township. Elizabeth Thompson. Present, calling in from Ypsilanti Township. Jennifer Green. Present, participating from the city of Ypsilanti. Phyllis Herzig. Present, calling from Ann Arbor. Bruce Estrain. Calling in from Ann Arbor. Jennifer Heckendorn. I'm present calling in from Detroit. Brenda McKinney. Jasmine Cooper. Present calling from Baltimore, Maryland. Allison Foreman. Annie Somerville. We do have quorum. Wonderful. And Taylor, just so you know, sometimes when people talk, it's echoing um somewhere from you so if you could look at your microphone and um speaker situation that'd be great all right next up we have public participation any members from the public wish to raise their hand and share something with us that'd be great going once twice barbara allowed to talk you can unmute. Yep. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to hop on today and um, give a quick update on what's going on with Ypsilanti Meals on Wheels in relationship to the vandalism that happened last weekend. Some of you may or may not know that um, overnight hours Friday and overnight hours Sunday, um, our vans were vandalized, four of them. And um, it was, um, you can look on our Facebook page to see photos, but the, the short version is, is our immediate out-of-pocket costs are $17,000, and we are in a situation where we're needing to build a garage. And in the meantime, we're having in-person security um, until we can do that. I wanted to share that um, the county and the Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation stepped up for those immediate costs along with many you know grassroots donors and it just shows how much love there is for what we're all doing in community because people just feel really strongly about that happening um i get a lot of questions about you know, were there cameras yes um but they couldn't make out the folks that were um doing this um and i'm working with law enforcement that if they get caught that um we talk about processes for restorative justice. And I get a lot of questions about that too. And it means that we're not looking, we're, we're looking for a, a solution that works for everybody. And um, one person did ask, and I'm going to be very clear, no, we're not going to ask them to deliver meals to vulnerable older adults, <laughs> um, but we are you know, thinking in those terms. So I just felt like it, in, um, the estimate for the garage is well over $100,000. And the county did say that they'd be interested in being a partner on that. So um, not for the whole amount, but if I can find other folks. So I just wanted to give you all an update and just let you know and answer any questions if that's appropriate. I can't remember what your rules are, sorry. Um, so that, yeah. Thank you. Um, there are no other members of the public here, so we'll turn it to response. Anyone like to respond? I guess just a quick question, Barbara. Are you guys able to still deliver all or most of your meals, or are you guys having to wait a little while? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That was my bad. I was trying to help you unmute, and we did at the same time, Barbara. I'm sorry. <laughs> Marie, you're just too fast for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, we were able to rent some U-Haul vans and tr you know small trucks to get the food out. Um, of course, at, at a pretty penny, that's part of that $17,000 out of pocket. That's not even touching what the damage was. So um, we had uninterrupted is just the, the, 
backstage got very stressful. Um, the only difference um, our folks saw was the fact that they saw a U-Haul truck. And for a couple of them, for a couple of days, it was pretty distressing to see a U-Haul truck because they're like, who is this? What's going on? And um, and then now that we kept them on the same routes, though, so that they're used to it now. And, and just oh, go ahead. one other quick follow up. Um, are sure. you able to um, are you are you having to hold? those U-Haul vehicles in the same place, or are you able to leave those in a safer temporary? Oh, location? well, everything, all of it is precious to us. So everything, Gene Butman offered us free secured parking until we could sort something else out. And that's going to happen until Monday. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. No Sorry, problem. I'm not used to muting and unmuting myself. There's just a lot of background noise here today. Phyllis, I saw hey. you up. Yeah, we're so sorry uh -huh. to hear about that. And um, I think I wish we had more as a commission that we ourselves can offer, but I'm so glad to hear that the county is already stepping up to be of some assistance. And I hope that if there's anything we as the commission can do if in the grand world of applying for grants, letters uh, of support are helpful. I hope you reach out to us or anything you can think of that we can be helpful. Uh, Cause you oh. do some wonderful work. Oh, thank you. I'm so touched by that. And I will keep you posted. <laughs> I, I, I mean, if we're, um, you know, I, I, as you can only imagine, I made sure to share with our community what was happening and um, folks responded. It's the bigger picture of building the garage that I think is where we're, it might get a little tough. So I will definitely coordinate with you and, and I will, if you don't mind every now and then I'll hop in on your meetings and let you know how things are going. Marta. Um, yeah, I wondered if you, in addition to looking at building a garage, if you'd looked into other options, like, for example, possibly partnering with uh, the public school district or the bus company about parking your vehicles in another location so you don't have to spend all that money to build a garage. Well, you know, that's a really good idea. And we had actually explored that with our volunteer drivers as well as our um, CCAs or um our um, uh, client care associates and the 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 back and forth of um, having to you know first of all just kind of the mental of pulling up and not seeing our vehicles is yeah. really hard and saying you know we're in a church and we can't even park there um, secondly is that um, having our folks having to work extra time to travel to a new location and then come back to get the food distribution and then go back out and then come back and drop off the van, get back to their vehicles is um, proving to be um, not easy for our folks. And lastly, because of Allison's amazing work, we grew a lot in the last 10 years and we've run out of space and we're trying to turn, you know, Chris Lemon loves this, lemons into lemonade. And um, as a result, you know, we can build a garage that would have a prep area that would work out very well for us. So um, if we're able to raise the money, and this is money that we would be raising that quite frankly, we're pretty sure wouldn't be invested in our operations. It's folks wanting to give for a capital growth. Um, so I, I really hear you on that and I'm not one to spend money willy nilly. Mm -hmm. um, the end also is, is when I stacked up the reasons to do it, it just became very clear. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah, and the other thing is that, you know, in terms of building the garage, you might be able to partner with a school uh, trades um, operation to have them do some of the work so it doesn't cost so much. I'm just, you know, thinking. Sure. Cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, fortunately, um, we've had six folks, um, you know, five, six groups, five of which who want to be, remain anonymous for now that are stepping up. And, um, you know, it, and, and certainly we, when we have actually a volunteer contractor 
And I think part of it, and that's, that's a big cost right there. It's their comfort level, but I will certainly run that up the flagpole. Um, we had an architect show up right away and to do us some drawings right away for free. So um, we're certainly getting donated services and certainly appreciate any ideas. So I'll add that to the list when I talk to the contractor. Thank and you. The unions are also possible, building trades unions are also possible. Yeah, yeah, we have a couple that sponsor us and we plan to approach them too. So um, thank you. Thank you. Yes, anything we can to keep resources flowing for what we really want to be doing is getting services out there. Um, the end also is um, showing us up a little bit so that we can do it even more effectively. Yeah, nice. Yeah, great. I'd add EMU to the list. I know they help build a, a bunch of stuff, including a pavilion in Milan. Um, yeah, so ironically, the, the chair of our board is the facilities director. So well, he's already, <laughs> I know he's already like, well, why can't I, I mean, it's yeah. been amazing. I've been getting some phone calls and, you know, just people reaching out and um, just coordinating it all um, with, you know, with a full heart and um, knowing everybody wants to do something and better understanding where people feel like they can best support. Like even you all coming up with all these suggestions is amazing. I thought I was just going to give a report and you'd say, okay, thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're like, no, 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 no. We're going to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, Phyllis, I see you. And then Bruce, you're next. To Quickie, um, and I apologize in advance. My computer keeps freezing and stuff. So please don't take it personally or Google's <laughs> coming at 11, so hopefully we're getting it fixed. Um, I was uh, so pleased to hear Barbara mention restorative justice as a um, step to resolve this problem um, going forward. And I just wanted to mention that uh, we have a wonderful community the dispute resolution center work and i just want to make sure that all of you on the call are aware of this so if you have any questions about um that uh talk with you um i've been involved there for about 15 20 years so um that's all Great. phyllis i'm so glad to hear that um what I do want to say is that, ironically, I ran the Community Conciliation Center like 30 years ago on the east side of Detroit, and that's where my restorative justice heart comes from. And um, I haven't, I actually, actually didn't have time. I was planning on reaching out to Belinda today just to let her know I put that out there. And um, so thank you, Phyllis, for keeping that fire lit. Bruce? Just one last question, and again, I offer again my um, my thoughts about you know what what this is meaning for the community. Um, you mentioned that they they had some video, but they couldn't identify. Did the did they indicate they have any um, theories or any leads or any ideas of who may be behind it? Um, no, they don't. I'm actually. Um... I had a chance, I went to the senior center corn roast last Saturday and had a chance to talk to council member St Stephen Wilcoxon. And um, he has arranged for he and I to meet with the police chief on Tuesday. We've been in communication with the police and deputies since then. And, you know, the, the theory is, is young people doing it for entertainment, um, not that you know there was anything else really going on um but you know it is disheartening that it's we're our bands are so clear <laughs> who we are and to have something like that happen but um we often find that sometimes you, know, you just kind of hear about things happenstance and maybe something can happen that way um just a quick thought that and when you're talking with steve um you know, in addition to, you know, the youth, I would also consider the fact that increasingly there's people from out of county with political agendas coming in and doing, you know, various kinds of vandalism and slight, you know, tendencies towards um, 
terrorizing populations. And so um, I wouldn't rule out something other than young people in Ypsilanti. Thank you for that comment. I'll definitely um, let Chief Moore and Councilman Member um, Wilcoxon know that that came up. Um, I'm 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 just a social worker. I'm not a criminologist, so I don't know. But um, you know, from what we could see, they were walking up, and um, but doesn't mean they didn't park somewhere else. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Margie. Uh, yeah. Um, was, uh, I, I knew nothing about this. Was it published somewhere on the news or? Um, it was on our Facebook page and then we shared it out to the Ipsy pages. Um, and I sent it out to say yes to seniors and barrier busters and Fox two did a small segment on it, but there's been a lot in the news this week. So I can imagine, um, what happened with us. <laughs> Um, might not have rose to the level of um, what happened in Chicago the other day. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so the, the I'll I'll try to find something on it. But um, the other yeah, thing it's right I on our Facebook page, so that's easy. Okay. Um, or yeah. go to Fox Two. Okay. Thank you. Um, the only other thing I thought of is many churches repair and um, their parishioners uh, homes or change whatever they need. Churches might be have people who are willing to volunteer their time. So. Oh, yes. Yes. Actually, I've been um, reaching out to community groups. You know, at this point, East of 23, um, because it helps to just have that kind of that focus. Um, and by virtue of being in the Baptist church, you know, we kind of get the word out that way. And also yeah. if you are part of a church group that you think would be interested in learning more about what we're doing, please let me know and happy to chat, um, happy to present to like a circle group or to um, like maybe a, a, you know, a volunteer group or a social justice group. I would be happy to do that. Okay. I'll, I'll think on that. Um, I, um, yeah, I'll have to give some thought to that. But of thanks. course, of course. Yeah, no, we're yeah, I mean, we're happy to get the word out because one thing that we're on one thing that um we've been analyzing is some of our trend line data and our numbers are going up steadily, which is probably not a surprise, but I was like, well, let's look at six months, let's look at um the data since we went from three days to five days and um when we went from three days to five days, our numbers went up. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Thank Great. you. Anyone else? Final comments for the public? <clears throat> Great. Then we'll close that out and uh, we'll move on to the approval of the minutes. Thank you so much, Barbara, for sharing during public comment. <clears throat> Do we have a motion to approve the June 7 minutes? I move we approve the June 7 minutes, Elizabeth. Support. Thompson. I'm sorry, I'm late. I had a hard time getting in, Marie. Oh, thanks for joining us. Um, all right, then voice vote, please, Taylor. Yeah. Juliet Ballard. Mar Larson. Sorry, I was actually muted. Uh, yes. Marie Gress? Yes. Margaret Reynolds? Yes. Elizabeth Thompson? Yes. Jennifer Green? Yes. Phyllis Herzig? Yes. Bruce Estrain? Yes. Jennifer Heckendorn? Yes. Brenda McKinney? Yes. Jasmine Cooper. Yes. Allison Foreman. Annie Somerville. Motion passes. Great. Uh, moving on to discussion items. Today we have a two for one presentation brought to you by Stephanie Hall of Ageways.
Stephanie is going to talk to us about their in-home programs, as well as the Silver Key Coalition. And Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you um, to tell us more. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna share my screen. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. You never know, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so like Marie said, um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to uh, go over some of Ageways and home services programs and then talk a little bit about the C Silver Key Coalition um, and Advocacy Coalition that we lead. Um, so first off, uh, specifically our in-home services program. So the ones I'm going to touch on today um, at first are our um, ACLS programs. So these are specifically uh, ACLS is the Administration for Community Living and Supports. Um, that's the department that we are under at the state. So these are in-home service programs um, specifically using Older Americans Act dollars and Older Michiganians Act dollars. So to touch on those and then I'll touch a little bit about our Medicaid program before I go into Silver Key. Um, and then at the end, I can, answer any, oh, I can answer any questions. And then we have Taylor here too, and she's a lot more familiar with these in-home services programs than I am. So between the two of us, we should be able to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so what um, is under these LC ACLS programs? So the programs I'm going to talk about today are our independent program, adaptive wellness, family respite program, the community living program, our community care management program, um, and then a new program that we're uh, working on implementing right now, our care, our care transitions program. So our independent program. Um, this program provides um, in-home safety for older adults who are at risk for things like falls um, and are also sitting on a wait list for one of our more intensive in-home service programs. So in this program, a caseworker is assigned to this individual. They perform a fall risk assessment. Um, and then out of that assessment, they then coordinate um, a PERS installation. So this is a um, medical device that, as you can see on the image, it's like those life alerts, like it's a medical, medical device that you can use um, to get a, um, emergency response to come out to you. So there's different types of those. It's not just the one that you wear. So they coordinate with that person what the best type of device is for them. Um, and then they work on installing that uh, with that person. They also provide ongoing monitoring and support throughout the year that this person is on this program. Um, so in this program, it is specifically just one year funded. Um, like I said, this is uh, often used or it is used with individuals that are on a wait list for a different program. So it's a resource that we can provide them while they're waiting for a different service. Um, so after one year of being in this program, uh, they can choose to continue to use this PERS device at a discounted rate. Um, but they're also offered uh, options counseling, connecting them to, to other community resources, services, um, and other things that they can utilize prior to that, prior to that disenrollment um, after they've been on the program for a year. So then we have our adaptive wellness program. Um, so this is a program that provides um, assistive devices and different technologies that help older adults uh, live more independently in their home. So again, with this program, a caseworker is assigned to them. They perform a um, home safety assessment. Then they coordinate what um, different technologies, different uh, tools that they need um, to perform uh, activities of daily life. Uh, so upon the receipt of these different devices, um, the caseworker uh, makes sure that they're able to use them and understand how they work um, before disenrolling them from this program. So. Uh, under this program, they get labor, installation, training of how to use it. They also get the different devices. Um, so this is not exhaustive, but some things that it might include are things like a wheelchair walker, um, medication dispensers, um, a reacher like you see here, grab bars, a shower chair and bench, those non-slip mats in the shower, um, different adaptive eating devices to make eating and drinking easier. Um, and then adaptive communication devices. But again, a caseworker, as you'll notice throughout all of these programs, a caseworker is assigned, they do an assessment and figure out what works best for the client. So in our family respite program. So with this program, um, it provides relief to family members who are providing caregiving activities for their loved ones. Um, so eligible participants that require continual supervision and assistance of activities of daily living. Um, so the respite care that's provided um, uh, 
is things like companionship, supervision, assistance with activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So in this program, again, a caseworker is assigned to the individual who's interested, assessment is conducted, um, and then a plan is developed uh, based on the identified needs of the individual. And so those that are in this program um, have routine monitoring and follow-up throughout the year as well. Um, so some things under this program that are provided are in-home respite, out-of-home respite, um, and, and uh, adult day center activities as well. Um, and then also the, the PERS device that I mentioned in the other program um, is available for those in-home recipients of this program. So then on to our little bit more um, intensive programs that we have. So the first is the community living program. So this provides those in-home services to older adults who don't have a great support system and they require um, some more uh, intensive support in the home with things like routine household chores, just uh, daily uh, activities of daily life. Um, and they have limited functions and not able to do things like meal preparation, uh, shop for themselves, run errands, um, all of those. So again, with this program, a caseworker is assigned, um, assessment is conducted to uh, figure out what this individual needs and what assistance they need in the home. Um, and then routine monitoring and follow-up is performed throughout the year. Um, so some of the things that, uh, and again, this isn't exhaustive, but some of the things that can be performed under this program are those homemaking services. So some like housekeeping, meal preparation, um, running errands, shopping for the individual. Uh, they're also giving, again, one of those PERS devices. So those emergency response devices, um, and as well as those assistive technologies and devices that we talked about in the previous program. Um, they're also provided transportation to get to and from um, things like medical appointments. So we also have the community care management program. So again, this provides in-home services to older adults who don't have that support, sy support system and require those um, assistance in activities of daily life. Um, so these again, include things like personal care, light housekeeping and meal preparation. Um, so in this program, there's a licensed uh, registered uh, uh, or a licensed RN and a social worker that are assigned to this older adult. So they tag team this to uh, conduct the assessment um, and develop a person-centered uh, service plan to figure out what this individual needs and provide them with those resources and services. Um, again, routine monitoring and follow-up is performed throughout the year for the individuals in this program. So some things in uh, this program that the individual might receive, some homemaking services, again, personal care services, um, those PERS devices, assistive technologies and devices, transportation, um, and then also medication management. Um, you'll notice those are specifically, you know, with the with the RN uh, portion of this program. So then one new program that has not been implemented yet, but that we're working on uh, getting started, uh, hopefully by the end of summer, early fall, um, is our care transitions program. So in this program, it's pr intended to provide um, proactive discharge planning, coaching, um, and post-discharge supports to older adults um, when they're moving from um, a hospital to back to home. So in this program, a community health worker would be assigned to this individual. Um, an assessment is performed to identify what they need to um, be able to transition back to their home successfully, and that personal care plan is uh, developed. Um, so, and then the community health worker uh, works with them to transition back home and follows up with them um, for 30 days post discharge uh, to, you know, see how things are going, make sure things are, are good for them transitioning back home. Uh, and this is ultimately to reduce hospital readmission and just, and you just improve uh, health outcomes because a lot of times individuals who transition back to their home from a hospital don't have a lot of these supports set up. So they end up going home and then something else happens and then they're back in the hospital and that's not what we want. Um, so these include things like connecting the individual to resources in their community, um, uh, educating them on any health and uh, disease that might have you know, landed them in the hospital in the first place, giving them some education on that, arranging <laughs> services. Um, all, all of this of course is person-centered planning, um, following up with their primary care physician to see what is needed. Uh, medical transportation as well, medication review, and of course those weekly follow-ups um, for up to 30 days post-discharge from the hospital. So then talking a little bit about um, some of our caregiver uh, programs, uh, it, it sounded like that was of interest to people here. So um, we have two uh, programs that we implement right now are two big programs that uh, really target caregivers. So our first one is the uh, caregiver coaching program. So in this program, it matches experienced caregivers who, you know, 
have have been around for a while, kind of know the label and a little bit well, uh, better to um, more new caregivers who may be new to that caregiving responsibility. Um, it matches them to uh, really do some, you know, some coaching, some mentoring. So it helps them kind of navigate the lay of the land, the waters. Um, it's really a support system for them while they're um, figuring out their caregiving responsibilities and what might be available for them in the community. Um, and this program is available to residents uh, in all six of our counties. Or um, if you're a caregiver caring for someone in our six counties. And then a fairly new program that we're piloting right now um, is our caregiver respite voucher program. Um, so in this program, it provides, you know, you hear from caregivers a lot, what do they need? More often than not, it's respite, um, respite care. So uh, in this program, it provides care vouchers of up to $575 to caregivers to purchase respite care for their loved one. Um, so they can, uh, through the um, platform that we use, they can use those vouchers to either purchase, uh, you know, a third party vendor to provide that respite care, or um, if they have someone in their circle, like a family member, neighbor, a friend, um, they can use this platform to pay for their services to provide respite care to their loved one. Um, this program does require a professional referral just to make sure, and, you know, that professional referral can be anyone in the community who's a professional saying, yeah, this is a caregiver of this, of this person. Um, and uh, the caregiver must be providing at least two hours of care a week. So um, this is grant funded. It's, uh, you know, we would love hopefully in the future for it to be a permanent program that we're able to offer. Um, but, you know, right now we're just piloting it for a short term. So I mentioned I'd uh, touch a little bit about our Medicaid program. So at the beginning of this, I talked a bunch about our ACLS programs um, that are our, you know, non-Medicaid programs, our ACLS funded. This is our um, kind of the counterpart. This is our Medicaid program for those more intensive in-home services. So this is for individuals who qualify for a nursing home level of care um, and are on Medicaid. Um, so through this program, you receive a lot of the same um, supports that you receive on like the community living program. But again, this is for Medicaid specifically. Um, so this is a um, HCBS Medicaid waiver program in Michigan. So this uh, through Medicaid, it pays for these home care services in an individual's home. Um, and these, you know, various services, again, not exhaustive, but um, they can cover things like tour services, adult day health, the community health worker, home delivered meals, respite services, transportation, medical devices, counseling, um, all of that, uh, specifically through the My Choice program. Okay, and then moving on, totally transitioning from all of the uh, programs that we offer to a little bit more advocacy work. So um, the Silver Key Coalition it, uh, was formed in 2013 and it consists of more than 40 organizations and agencies. And the Silver Key Coalition is really working in Michigan to make it a no wait state for home and community-based services and home delivered meals. And we're advocating around the state, um, you know, our, our tagline is make Michigan a no wait state. So. The Silver Key Coalition specifically advocates for those non-Medicaid services. So funding for all the programs that I talked about at the beginning, um, specifically the you know, community living program, which is kind of the, the counterpart to the My Choice Medicaid program. And we really want there to not be a wait list across the state for those in-home services. You know, preaching to the choir here, but we know, um, you know, enable giving people these supports and services around uh, allows them to be able to age in their homes and communities, which is where they want to be. So that's what the Silver Key Coalition is advocating for. Um, so, you know, individuals who, um, you know, would want to use these programs, we say are sometimes some of the worst off because once you're on Medicaid, you know, you can, as you saw that, that list of all of the services that you qualify on Medicaid, but if you're just $1 over that Medicaid, limit, you now don't qualify. You're obviously not on Medicaid, but you can't pay out of pocket rates to have, you know, in home, those in home services, because those those are expensive for you. You're not you're it's not like you're making a lot of money to pay those private rates anyways. So um, we really want to provide those services for that kind of middle group of people. So um, uh, at the end of last year, um, there was a wait list of more than 7000 older adults who are waiting to receive services. So again, these are things like personal care, homemaking, respite care, um, home delivered meals. And again, this is throughout the state because um, this is a statewide coalition. 
Um, we know older adults who remain on this wait list are five times more likely to end up in a nursing home. Um, this is from a, a study that the Silver Key Coalition did um, a bit ago towards the end of, um, I think this was in like 20, 2016 maybe, um, but did a, did a study then uh, and older adults who are on the wait list are five times more likely to end up in a nursing home, 20% more likely to remain um, living in their own home and twice as likely to have received health care from a hospital emergency room in the last 90 days. Um, so it really is a uh, cost savings, you know, it's cheaper to provide um, uh, services to people in their homes than to have them in a hospital or in a nursing facility. Uh, so um, addressing this wait list could be, you know, of course, where people want to be, but also a cost savings to the state. And the demand continues to grow for these programs um, with the direct care workforce shortage, increased costs of providing care. Um, it ultimately makes it harder to get rid of that wait list. Um, as you can see, with over 7,000 now, um, it's really hard to eliminate that. Um, but the Silver Key has been working to do that, to do just that in the last 10 years. Um, so at the end of every fiscal year, we get waitlist data directly from the department um, to develop our budget request. We uh, pride ourselves on being very data driven. We take those numbers that we receive directly from the department on statewide waitlist numbers for in-home services and home delivered meals. Um, they tell us how much it costs to provide care um to those individuals and then that's how we come up with our um ask every year um so for this last budget ask the request was nine million for home and community-based services and one million for home delivered meals um, unfortunately there was not any appropriation included for either of those um it is worth noting we do separate out instead of just asking for 10 million total we like to um separate them out because you can see that's not like it's 50-50. Um, there's not, you know, an even wait list. There is, there is a lot fewer people on a wait list for home delivered meals than there are for home and community-based services. Um, and then to be frank, um, the legislature is usually a lot more willing to say, yeah, we'll give you 1 million for home delivered meals. That's an easy thing we can throw in there. Um, but 9 million for home and community-based services is often, you know, that, that that's a lot. But we, um, like I said, we come every year with a data-driven, this is the wait list, this is how much it costs. This is what we want to do. Um, so looking at uh, state appropriations for fiscal year 24, um, they are 15.8 million above 2014 levels. Uh, so that means uh, doing some math with uh, um, leveraging some funds and what and being able to use those funds as match funds to draw down another and whatnot. Um, uh, that's more than 116.8 million invested in Michigan's older adults since 2014. Um, and it's it, it's expected that we were able to leverage over 20 million in local matching funds. Um, and I'll give everyone this presentation so you can have the website on it as well, but I just wanted to throw that on there. Um, so home and community-based services and home delivered meals in Washtenaw County. Um, so currently, uh, fortunate, you know, fortunately for us, there is not um, in our region, we do not have wait lists for home delivered meals. That is not to say that there is not unmet need for home delivered meals. Um, we just don't have a wait list, but there are a lot of people who are receiving services um, through, uh, you know, receiving home delivered meals Un under their care plan. They should be receiving more meals, but we're not able to fully meet that need um, based off of the funding that we have. So this could be individuals who are receiving, you know, only one meal a day when they should be receiving more. Um, so, and that's also not including, you know, there's a, a lot more individuals who are needing different types of meals. So like kosher, vegetarian, et cetera, that we're just not able to meet. So while I say we don't have a wait list, that does not mean that, great, we've, we're serving everyone that needs assistance. There, there's nothing else to do here. Um, so currently for um, our community living program, we have 111 individuals that are on the wait list in Washtenaw County for that. Um, which is about 11% of the total wait list that we have um, throughout our region. And Washtenaw County is about 10% of our older adult population. So it's pretty comparable to, you know, the, the portion of the wait list compared to the portion of older adults in our region. Um, and you can see, I kind of, as far back as I could go, I was able to pull our um, wait list since 2019. Um, you can see, you know, it's, it's kind of fluctuated a little bit. So it was lower in 19, went up a little bit went up to 21, down a little bit. Um, 23, that does look low, but we had some issues with our, um, we were transitioning to a new system uh, and data was lost. So it, it's not the most reliable number there. I just wanted to point that out. Um, and then it's back up. Um, and again, these are, I was only able to get, unfortunately with our system, we were only able to get a uh, full region. So 
take about 10% of those would be what Washtenaw County numbers are. So, um, you know, although the Silver Key Coalition, although we have, um, you know, made great strides in helping the legislature understand the importance of home and community-based services and then putting some additional funding towards this throughout the years, um, you know, they, they can put a little bit, but it's the amount of people that are then needing services as the, uh, pop, the older adult population continues to grow kind of you know, we're, we're not able to catch up really, unless they, um, you know, it'd be great if they were able to say 9 million, this is what you need, this is what we're going to give you. Um, so, and this also could just be, you know, individuals who are learning more about this program and the needs of this program. So there's a lot of things that can go into this, but yeah, as you can see, um, the wait list has, you know, if anything, gone up since uh, 2019. So that's what I have for you. Um, happy to answer any questions. And like I said, um, Taylor's here too. And uh, she knows much more than me when it comes to our in-home services program, so. All right, so up first, I see Brenda. And then- Yes. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, this question is for you. How can I get an actual hard copy of this information? Um, I know you guys email it, but the print is too small for me. And is there a way I can get a hard copy? I'll be happy to pay for it. Yeah, we can mail you one. Um, you, I'll, I'll contact you afterwards and get where you want me to mail it to, and we can mail you one. Thank you. Oh yeah, no problem. Bruce and then Elizabeth. Um, first of all, both to um, you and Taylor. Thank you. It was a great presentation. Um. Yeah, Stephanie, sure. do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, I didn't realize I was. Sorry. As you're watching me take notes. <laughs> um, very informative and very well presented. <clears throat> so I appreciate that. Um, a couple of questions. Um, number one, um, you mentioned that uh, um, Washington County is about 10% of the state's senior population. Just our region. <clears throat> so, our no, region. Okay. But yeah. the, the region... Um, that Ageway serves is about a third of the overall state population. The yeah, we're 30%, population. so. Yeah, so the question I have is, um, are resources distributed to the AAAs in a way that reflect the amount of um, population in those areas? Are you guys, because I'm looking at those limited resources and, and the waiting lists and other kinds of things, and I think these programs are a terrific set of programs. But are we getting our fair share um, is one is the one question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how um, how the funding gets distributed out. And again, this is just our um, so like the, the most funding we get. So our Older Americans Act funding or Older Michiganians Act funding um, is distributed through um, uh, the uh, intrastate funding formula. So basically at the you know federal level, they have this, you know, bunch of money. And they have a funding formula that distributes out to the state based on things like older adult population. Um, uh, I'm not totally sure of all the factors from the federal level, um, but once it gets down to the state, every 10 years, they update the IFF. And this is set by the Commission on Services to the Aging. Um, so every 10 years, they update this. Um, and then that's how the funding gets distributed out to the AAAs. And this includes um, how many individuals are in your uh, region, minority, um, low income, they just added limit, limited English proficient and 85 plus. And then there's also a base of 5,000 and a square mile factor. So they have this whole funding formula. Um, every 10 years we advocate for, you know, how how we want it changed to help, help uh, you know, our region specifically. We were supportive of adding the 85 plus and the limited English proficient this past year. So all that's to say they do use this funding formula to distribute out and we do get the, the most funding compared to other regions because we are 30% um, of the population. And we receive, I think it was like 29% of the funding. So it's pretty, um, it's pretty comparable. The wait lists that I was telling you are, are you know, you, you talk to any other AAA around the state and they're going to have pretty uh, comparable wait lists. Uh, some, a lot of regions do have wait lists for home delivered meals. Um, so that's a, a nice thing for us, but everywhere has wait lists for um, those home and community-based services. So just a quick follow up. So given you mentioned that the Silver Key Coalition advocated for, but didn't, and, I, and they do some really wonderful work, but they advocated for, but didn't receive what 
they were, were asking for at the state level. Are there real champions anywhere at state level government, either in the legislature or at the in the you know Whitmer administration that are trying to change that um, that situation? Because it seems like um, without some real champions up there, and I don't mean to go into ex exactly who, but um, yeah. it just seems like there's a if we're dependent on primarily on some federal dollars at this point, when we're not getting a whole lot of additional state dollars or for that matter, additional county dollars, um, it seems like we're, we've are we got a long ways to go in getting more adequate resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so I can just speak for our region since I don't, um, you know, don't talk to a ton of legislators from other regions. We have people on the coalition that kind of do their, their own areas. Um, I do think we have, you know, 9 million is a big ask, understandable. Um, you know, it's unfortunate we weren't able to get anything. We have gotten little increases in the in the past. Um, we do have pretty decent um, advocates for this. I mean, you talk to any, no matter what side of the aisle, you talk to any legislator and you talk about the importance of home and community-based services um, compared to funding for institutional settings, and they're going to agree with you. So mm -hmm. that's not translating, obviously, in the amount of funding we're putting towards it. I mean, we put a lot more funding towards institutional settings um, and nursing homes than we do for in-home services. So, uh, where, the, you know, what, what they're supporting isn't translating to the budget. That's where, you know, of course we just need more advocacy. There has been talk, you know, do we continue with these high asks? Because we, you know, we have always been data driven. We like to say, this is how much it will cost to, to do this, to reach all these people. But nine million is a is a really large ask. So you know it, it doesn't make more sense to come down. But but then that's not data driven. That's just saying, hey, we can make a a nick at it. You know you know I don't know. So um, you know of course there's advocacy to be done at the state level uh, to put more funding towards this to support these programs. There's also advocacy to be done at the federal level with support for the Older Americans Act. Um, as they're especially right now as they're working on the next year's budget. Um, the house budget was released and there was some increases in some of our line items to support uh, some of these programs, but then there was decreases in nutrition. Um, so, you know, all this comes down to uh, holding legislators accountable and saying, this is, you know, this is where you, you say this, the importance of this. So we need, you know, additional funds to do this. But, but I do think all this to say, we do have some um, pretty good champions, at least in our region that are in, or are wanting to make headway with supporting these programs a little more. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Elizabeth and Dina. Thanks again for the, the presentation. Um, I am curious because some of the programs you like the adaptive wellness are really one-time programs. Some are very time limited like your, um, new care transitions. And I was wondering what process, if any, HWAS has to do follow up after those initial interventions. Mm -hmm. Because one thing we know is uh, situations keep changing over time. Are you dependent on the um, service recipient to get in contact with HWAS? Or is there some sort of standardized outreach, say three week, three months or six months or a year later mm -hmm. that you do a check-in. Yeah. Taylor, do you know this? Because I know, so like with our, you know, obviously our, our um, like PERS program, they're followed up for a year, but then our discharge. I know when we discharge from a program, you do some care planning to make sure that there's resources and stuff available, but I'm not, um, I, do we follow up anything post this, this enrollment? With care transitions, we can't say yet because it hasn't really started. Um, but the independent wellness, they give them an option to, they start talking a little bit ahead of the discharge to see if they still need continued um, services. And then they'll offer if like, depending on the wait list and stuff, might upgrade them into the community living program, um, depending on needs. And also enrollment numbers. So they still have to have staff that takes on. And then um, the wait lists, those that are on the wait list, they get follow, or they get checked in on every four months by our resource specialists to ensure 
um, if they need to be reprioritized because our wait list is um, priority driven. So based on certain needs, so they check in and then it could reprioritize and then they uh, enroll people with the greatest need first. Um, but I can't really say, but normally it does depend on the participant to kind of call and get assessed for services to be placed on wait lists or to get enrolled into other programs. Um, once they're, but again, like Stephanie said, they do a lot of discussion before discharge um, because once you're in the program, you don't get out of the programs unless you choose to, or you pass away or anything like um, that. So you still have to be cognizant of the people who are already in the programs before kind of shifting. Does it that answer your question? sounds like that might be an issue at some point Ageways might want to explore because um, I've encountered uh, both seniors and their caregivers who lack awareness that once a connection is made, that that connection isn't forever. And they don't, you can tell people you need to call, but whether they will or not is another problem. And it might be just something as discussions go at looking at future program planning and design, you might consider whether that might be a worthwhile build-in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's the whole, always the discussion of like closing the loop, right? So yeah. even if you know, someone contacts you and you give them resources, closing the loop to say, did you contact, get in touch with them? Um, it's a th you know thing all over the state we talk about because it's always, we give resources, but there's not as much of closing that closing that loop. Uh, Dina, then Brenda. I Stephanie have a couple questions um, about, um, about how you like kind of share information about these program, like how many people you're serving in these programs um, specific to Washtenaw County. Um, I know that I, I have, um, looked through Ageways' website and looked into um, some of the public reports that you have. And I haven't always been able to find uh, good data that's specific to Washtenaw County. So like, you know, there may be a report that shows how, what you've spent in a particular program or how many people you've served in a particular program, but across the six regions. So mm -hmm. do you do you routinely report out um, you know, what is being of, of these programs, how many people in Washtenaw County are actually receiving these services, you know, how much money is spent in each of these programs. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just like add kind of the, one of the reasons I'm asking is that mm -hmm. there, I'm hearing, you know, from our county commissioners that there are questions about how much funding is, is being spent in Washtenaw County on seniors. <laughs> And um, I think there's some pretty clear information on meals, but it, I think in my opinion, I'm gonna say, and so maybe others have different information, but it's very hard to tease out anything else, you know, in terms of, of services, maybe transportation, there's a little more concrete information, but like caregiver services, I think it's really challenging to actually, you know, nail, nail down, um, what funding is available for these types of services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, so, cause we, so we report all of that to the state through NAPIS. Um, and it used to be that we would have NAPIS reports that were published every year. Um, unfortunately the last, and so we ask for these two, um, cause you know, we have this information. Typically it was always published in this big report that you could see throughout the state of different AAAs their services through the SNAPIS report that hasn't been published since 2019. And that's a depart department uh, report that was typically published. So um, my understanding is that there are, they've hired someone to start doing this again. Um, but yeah, we don't, um, you know, that was always put out to the community through the NAPIS report. Unfortunately, the last few years, we also have had some issues because we transitioned um, with our, uh, system that we record all of this in. So we've lost some information. Uh, we have a new uh, EMR, a new system. So um, we haven't had, honestly, the best, the most reliable the last few years because of that. 
Um, but the NAPIS report was the report that typically would say all of that. And Taylor, if there's anything I missed. Um, I don't know. I know that we've been working on something in our department. I don't know if that's something that we can share, Stephanie. Yeah, so we put out, um, and this goes to the counties, uh, so it doesn't necessarily get shared super widely, um, but every year, every fiscal year, we give the counties, um, you know, a report of how much funding, how many individuals served, and how many units served for each of our programs. So like the My Choice program, our veterans program, our obviously home delivered meals, and then um, our partners, so who we served, you know, that through who that funding went to and how many individuals we served, and so then a total count of how many we served through those programs to the county. Um, and though, yeah, those are going out shortly for this last fiscal year to the counties. But again, that isn't super, that's not just given out to the community, that's given out to county commissioners. Because how, so how are, um, with our uh, OAA funding, you know, four counties, uh, you might may or may not know this, uh, counties have to provide certain match funding in order to draw down from the funding that we have through the OAA and the Older Michiganians Act. And so again, through a formula, um, that's very similar to the one that I was just explaining about how our funding is distributed to us um, through this formula is how that match goes out to counties. Uh, and then the counties have to provide that funding. So then we give them a report at the end of every year about this is how many we served in this county for these different mm -hmm. programs. Okay, so can I just maybe, this is to the group, maybe just put a request for our group mm -hmm. to I think that this is important to follow up on. Um, I don't I don't know, you know, if this is a request to age ways to mm -hmm. see that yeah. report or if this yeah. is a request to the county um, to see that report. But I, I think it's important information, um, particularly as it relates to communicating about um, the senior millage and you know where um, that millage funding can um, mm -hmm. really address gaps. But you know, if, if we don't know, you know, how that, how that OAA funding is being spent, it's hard to address the, the gaps question. Yeah. And we can, we can definitely share that. So uh, we're putting the finishing touches on it now. So once it's finalized, we can definitely share that with the group. Okay. Um, I'll double check, but I don't, I don't see why not. It's just typically it goes to the counties, but I don't see why, why it can't be shared. Great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Brenda, then Bruce. Yes, Stephanie, you were explaining to Bruce about the program, and I don't quite understand, and I need you to explain to me, you said minority, low income. I, I don't, I didn't understand what you meant when you was ex explaining to Bruce about the programs. Yeah, yeah, so um, that's so, how our, oh, sorry, go ahead, Brenda. Yeah, were, were you saying minority, low income, or minorities and low income? I, I didn't understand that. Yeah, so those are those are separate. So this is um, talking about how the funding at the state level is distributed out to different AAAs. And there's a formula basically so that they're able to take the larger pot of money and distribute it out to AAAs based on, um, you know, the individuals in their region. So in that formula, there's like, you know, a one way for total 65 plus population. There's, uh, you know, a half a way for the total minority population, half the way for limited English proficient. Um, and I, I don't remember if they're half or whole weights, but you know, and then there's a weight for 85 plus. So basically in that whole formula for every region, um, under each of those, there's like, you know, the number of 65 plus, number of minority individuals, number of in limited English proficient. Um, and then that gets to a percentage of a total weighted percentage. And that's the percentage of that total big pot of funding that goes out to that AAA. Does that make sense? It's a funding yeah. formula. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and so, and through the Older Americans Act, you know, we're, we're charged with, um, uh, you know, uh, pri prioritizing or, you know, making sure that we reach individuals who, um, you know, are maybe like the harder to reach, our minority individuals, limited English proficient. And so that's why some of those were um, added into the funding formula, including 85 plus, because those individuals might need some more services. Um, but yeah, that's just how funding's distributed now. It's, you know, the okay. not, they're not, they're not glamorous stuff. That's just how funding. Yeah. It, it, because the way it, it made it sound to me, it was that it was minority low income people, but they're separate. They're They're separate in the formula, yes. Okay. Yeah. Bruce, then Elizabeth. Um, 
I'm sort of building on, on both Dina and Brenda's last comments. Um, the question of how information does get out to people and how well they're receiving it, um, given that last um, mm -hmm. report by the University of Michigan that was funded by Michigan Health Endowment Fund, they seem to indicate about two out of every three older people, older adults, are not aware of a lot of these programs and services. Mm -hmm. And given that um, communicating, especially to certain elder populations, can be very challenging, the question mm -hmm. I have is, other than sort of posting things on websites and hoping that local organizations will have better you know, outreach, some of whom do, some of whom don't, how can we better get information about the availability of these services out to people, even if there's waiting lists? Nonetheless, mm -hmm. I think the state saw that there was even more people wanting this information. I guess the, the challenge is really for collectively, how do we reach how to identify and reach um, these seniors and communicate with them in a way that would allow them to understand what is available to them and how they could access it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's something our communications team has been really trying to, uh, you know, not that they didn't work on this before, but really trying to um, kind of ramp up the number of individuals we were finding, you know, individuals not knowing wh who we were, what an area agency on aging does, the fact that no matter where you live, there is one. Um, so our communications team really tries to do a lot of, diff, you know, put their hands in a lot of different buckets. So we do a lot of community events or we try to get into as many as we can. I I just did two this week. Our communications team does some because a lot of older adults like to go to, you know, a caregiver event or they like to go to their senior centers and find resources there. So we try to do as many of those as possible. They do um, like some TV ads. If the funding's available, they do radio ads, um, like newspaper ads they try to do that of course there's you know social media posts that they do as well um but honestly a lot of this comes down to uh, you know word of mouth like a lot of people you know receive some services they figure out what a what a triple a is and then they tell their neighbor or they they go and see their friends at their senior center and they tell them out like oh there's this program and and so you know we try to get out as much as possible of course you know nonprofit, we do we do kind of as much as we can um with that but uh whenever i do my events, I always like to say, like, if you tell one person or you tell, you know, they don't even have to be older adults because, you know, we want people to know about this at, you know, they could be a caregiver caring for someone and they need to reach out to us to tell them. So, um, yeah, all that's to say, we, we try to do as much as we can. There can always be more, but um, I would always encourage all of you to tell people and then hopefully they can tell people and, and whatnot. But we have found that um, uh, they, they did some research on this, that there is a little bit more, that, that the word's been working. People have been figuring out who we are and who the Area Agency on Aging is in their neighborhood or in their area um, more these last few years. So um, that's what I would say. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth, then Margie. Um, Stephanie, I think many people might not know what the NAPIS a reporting oh, okay. system is, and I'm wondering if you might be able to explain it for those of us who aren't familiar with the state government requirements. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So, so basically, what Elizabeth just said, it's um, so since we do get federal and state funds, um, every dollar that we spend out of out of that pot of funding, um, and everybody that we serve ha it has to um go through the NAPIS for. I don't know what I can't remember what NAPIS stands for off the top of my head. Um, but it's a report that uh, kind of that we have to do. It's a requirement to show how all that funding spent, who we're serving, um, and it goes to the state, and then it has to go up to the federal government as well. Um, and like I said, this report used to be published, and it was published every year, and people could access it um, for every region throughout the country, but uh, that hasn't been lately. And it hasn't been made available on the state level either. Um, yeah, so so basic so because we have it's not like we haven't been reporting that like we have to report that. Oh yeah, yeah, know, yeah. We have to report that to state, but they just they just don't have the report to to pull it. And I and there, I think there's been some, you know, basically my understanding is at the state that there we have, there's like a new person who's trying to basically pull this information again to start reporting out um, the information that they're gathering, but it just hasn't been yet. So it might be an interesting thing that people might want to consider do if we want to actually write a letter request to the State Department requesting our county's data and see mm -hmm. if we get anything. 
Yeah, we're, I mean, we're really hoping, uh, I think they were hoping to get one done for this past year. Um, but I, I, and that's all to say, from my understanding, I don't think it will go back to 2019. I think it will just be picking up now. So kind of those, that information is, unless you, unless you can ask everyone around the state to pull it, I think it's kind of lost, unfortunately. But, um, you know, we, we always use a lot of that information from the NAPIS report. So um, it's really useful. And like I said, it's, it's available to everyone when it is report, when it is published and it's for the whole state. Margie. Yeah, um, Stephanie, maybe you mentioned this, uh, uh, but I missed it. Um, you know, in your transition program, um, it seems to me, uh, I don't, maybe you collaborate with the health systems or the insurance companies. Do they pay if you, I mean, you're, you're really helping them out to reduce hospitals, rehospitalization. Have you approached them at all about uh, uh so we do so through this program that's kind of where we're at right now is we are um working with the um health systems to basically for them to you know in the in the system be able to identify who needs this care transitions program and then we're able to um assist them from there um uh you know that's all so every all the funding for the care transitions program is again through our older americans act dollars so this isn't you know funded mm -hmm by the health systems at all. I mean, that's that's a great argument to say, yeah, we're saving them some money to do that. So pay us for it. I, we would have the same argument, but yeah, this this is fully funded through Older Americans Act dollars um, just to help the individual. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. thank you. Yeah, I love that argument though. I would mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> agree. Um, I had a question. So on one of those last slides, you were showing the number of your wait list. And in 2023, the wait list dropped um, a couple of hundred and then the next year went up. And I was wondering if there was anything going on that year that yeah. helps. Yeah. So we that year, um, there was some program realignment. So like changing of the programs, individuals were switched to, you know, to different programs that fit them better. They did a lot more work on the wait list to kind of tease that out. That was also the year that we switched EMRs to electronic medical records. So we think that some, you know, we yeah. think information was lost in that transition. It was a whole, it was a, I'm glad I didn't have to do anything. In <laughs> from what I, from the, from the person that got me those numbers, those were the reasons that she said she thinks like that, that might be a little bit of an unreliable number in 2023. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, and then my last question, um, how do Washna County wait lists. So Washtenaw County currently with no senior millage compared to counties with a millage in your service area. Um, so program, so uh, I'll, I'll speak based off of like the two counties in our region that have senior millages. I'm a little bit more familiar with those. So um, of course in our region, like I mentioned, our region doesn't have wait lists for home delivered meals, but the millage counties are able to, like I said, eat those, uh, you know, get them more meals. If they're only receiving one through the program, they're able to get more based off of their care plan. Um, they're able to get those vegetarian kosher meals. They're basically be able, being able to um, properly served, serve those in that program who are being underserved. Um, when it comes to these specific home and community-based services, um, I can say for St. Clair County, they fund this, um, like, an, like an independent program. So they fund these PERS, for and individuals who need them in the county, whereas we fund that for one year for individuals that are on our wait list, they're able to just, you need this, we're able to fund this for you. So they're able to do some of those, like again, with the, the adaptive wellness, they're able to have to uh, provide those different technologies to individuals um, and, and more individuals than we're able to do on the program. So um, when it comes to like, obviously our My Choice program that's Medicaid specifically, but um, even our community living program, which is more intensive, in home services, if you're able to get some of those, you know, assistive technologies and the PERS, the PERS device and be able to get some assistance with a ramp or those types of things before needing more intensive services, um, the county really, you know, with millage funds is able to do a lot of that stuff. Um, like in St. Clair County, they based our, their like PERS program off of the one that we did and just are able to, you know, meet the need better basically. That's great. Yeah. All right, final questions for Stephanie? Awesome. Thank you Who's so much for your time. Vice President. What? what? 
Final question, who's going to be the vice president? <laughs> I know I'm on the edge of my seat. I am mm -hmm. on the edge of my seat. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning, Stephanie. This is oh, really yeah, no helpful. Problem. Yeah. If you think of any questions afterwards, you know, everyone, everyone knows me. You can reach out to me and I'll make sure to share the presentation. And you'll put that in the mail for me, Stephanie? Yes. Yes. I will work with our staff to get something in the mail for you. And I'll thank reach you. out to you to get your address. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right. So we're moving on to subcommittee updates. First up is communications. Any updates from the communications group? Nope. Awesome. Uh, second is town hall. Brenda, you wanted to share about the town hall. Um, I really don't have any uh, updates except for um we are going, we, there was some discussion about this year's town hall and um, I did the very best that I could. Um, it's not a paid uh, position. And uh, so I'm going to look at some different things for next year. And um, hopefully I can get some more input from the committee or the board for next year. Great. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Uh, Phyllis? It was not the one who shared her. I can't understand her. Can anyone? Um, I was there last year. I can try that. I'm sorry, Phyllis. Your connection is uh, really choppy, and we're not able I'm to sorry. hear much. Okay. Uh, but Jen, no. Can there's no chat or question ability to write. Anything, no, but if you want to email okay. it to me, I'm happy to right. read it to the group. Um, okay. Is this is this the report for the committee that I'm on with Phyllis and? Um, no, no, we're still doing town hall right now. Okay. Okay. Going once, twice, Elizabeth. To give Phyllis a little chance to email you, Marie, if she wants to with her questions or comments. Mm -hmm. um, I would just say we may want to rethink how we do a, a town hall, if it really is a useful way of sharing information, because we did get a lot of service providers there, but not an audience. I also think we need to rethink the usefulness of keeping that town hall mode, which has a lot of our leadership, specifically government leadership on the local county and state level sharing, because the questions that were asked from the people who were there were very oriented to specific service questions how can I get this and how can I get that? Um, we, I think maybe thinking of it the next time we do it in a context of, as Bruce was mentioning, how do we share this information about available services to people in a way that maybe they aren't getting now through the channels that, um, Ageways is able to use or other entities are able to use and maybe kind of rethinking how we look at it in terms of making it the best use of our time, especially Brenda's time, and uh, which is very time consuming, putting it all together and meeting our goal, which is sharing information. Um, I also think that 
um, we might want to take a more localized approach. Um, although we had this one in Chelsea, the local groups in Chelsea weren't as involved. Um, while our first one, which had a bigger turnout, was in Ipsy Township, and those Ipsy Township people who were involved it, who were elders and advocates, were very involved. So we really, I think before we commit to doing another one, we really want to do some more intensive planning instead of leaving it to a small committee to to put in the work. And we may even, it would not, I think, necessarily be a bad idea to revisit this with the new group of commissioners in January. We'll also be post-election, so we'll know what the outcome of the millage proposal was and what kind of data the county commissioners might be needing from us related to that. So I went on at length. So hopefully, Phyllis, that gave you the chance to email your comments if you wanted to. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Yes, Phyllis was able to email me her questions. Uh, the first one was, how was the attendance? And the attendance was low for community members. We had a, a solid panel. Everyone from the panel came. We had um, tables of service providers, local and regional in the back. Um, that was good. We just didn't have the attendance um, of residents that we had hoped for. Um, and I can say that Brenda and I also debriefed a bit at our officers meeting about, you know, things that worked well at the first one that didn't work the same way for, you know, the the Chelsea community and, and some of the things even Elizabeth mentioned, we talked about different things doing differently um, for next year. So wanted to acknowledge attendance was low. We acknowledge it. <laughs> and we're going to work on a different plan for next time. Um, and then her second question, uh, Phyllis asked what topics were covered. Um, so it was a safety town hall, um, but because there were some politicians there, they also took a little time to go off book and have some of their own additional things uh, that they brought to the table in addition to the safety topics that Brenda asked them to cover. Um, the, I, from the few people of the public that were there, at least that I heard, um, they really enjoyed the Bank of America presentation. She had a lot of specific things to do if you find yourself in a scam and how to quickly get out of that kind of situation. This is the time frame you have and stuff like that. Brenda, anything else you wanted to cover on the topics? Anything else you wanted? Not to at all. Not at Pardon? all. Great. Um, Bruce? Um, I just want to um, quickly comment on the fact that I thought Brenda did a, a really nice job and, and the group to pull what they did together. And um, it is disappointing that there weren't more people that turned out, but I think that's really part of a larger communication challenge that we have. And I'm not sure what the, what the, um, the reach or the purview of the communications committee is. And maybe all of us collectively, we need to think about, you know, maybe we need to hang out a pickleball course, or maybe we need to do other kinds of things. But um, it's not easy getting information out, number one. Number two, it's not always easy for a number of people who probably would benefit a lot from these, um, these meetings to actually physically get there. I'm not sure whether we had any kind of online um, participation or, or, or anything, but um, this question of getting information out, knowing who the, the community is and getting information out on a fairly regular basis, I know there's people working on it and I know they're trying their best, but I think we're, we really should collectively and, and maybe the communications committee and maybe the, um, the town hall committee and maybe all of us can just think about, is there some other ways that we can um, sort of 
picking up on what Elizabeth was saying too, that maybe we just need to rethink a lot of this. Great. Anyone else maybe, on town hall? Oh yeah, go maybe, ahead, Marky. Well, maybe we need to put this on um, a future agenda, maybe after the first of the year, I think somebody suggested. Uh, but it it we truly need to talk about it. Um, and so I just say we put it on an agenda. Okay. Sounds good. All right, then um, the final subcommittee moving forward. Millage, do you guys have something to share? Jasmine, do you want to jump in or I can? I know that um, <laughs> maybe Phyllis, um, if you <laughs> are able to. Go Bruce. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> reluctant to even try. It's so faulty here. Well, I'll start in and, and Jasmine, it was Jasmine, myself and, and Phyllis, and we, we had a good conversation. It was on the heels of the successful um, millage announcement and vote. And we talked about sort of the next steps and recognized that Say Yes is really taking a lead in that, um, which has been good. And I know that um, they're, they've got a number of things that they're looking at um, doing over the, the, the short term. Um, the I think the other thing we talked about was this sort of thorny question of what can the council do either individually or collectively. And one thing that we settled on, which I'm not sure we had enough time yet to it just came, it just came at the end of the conversation, which was last week. We were going to try to at least reach out to a handful of other groups that have been involved in millages in the past for like Parks and Rec, for example, to see how they, what strategies they were able to use and how they advocated for um, for their millage. And maybe we would learn something from them. I know I didn't have any luck reaching the one folk group I was trying to reach, but, um, and maybe people on, on this call know more about how some previous millages have um, succeeded. I know Say Yes has got a pretty reasonable plan of what they want to do. There's still a lot of unanswered questions about raising money, getting, you know, for yard signs and things like that. Um, but again, it comes down to how do we, what is the content of the communication? And I know that there's uh, some previous work that's been done in that area. And secondly, what are the strategies for getting the word out? Um, and the one thing I know uh, we, we touched back on, and I'll stop after this, was that you know, Jasmine, for example, had mentioned at one of our previous meetings that, you know, we should be really trying to reach out to younger people and a more diverse audience, not just to those who are older or those who work with older, um, because this is a kind of investment in the future. Um, and as we know, everybody is aging. So um, I'll stop there. But Jasmine, do you want to add anything or Phyllis, can you jump in at all? Yeah, it was mainly that and we're kind of like trying to strategize like more ways to get the word out like as you mentioned uh it's so, like promoting like the um say yes to seniors website and things like that um as potential mechanisms great elizabeth i see your hand i know there was some discussion at our meeting in june about getting some input from county staff about the line we need to walk between what we as an individual mm -hmm. can do to advocate versus what we can saying we are a member of the Commission on Aging um, do or what we can do as a group. And I was wondering if you had gotten, if the officers had gotten any feedback yet from mm -hmm. county staff on that because i would hate to have um all the advocates have worked really hard on sharing information and i would hate for us to do something that would be seen as inappropriate 
that then might take over the discussion mm -hmm. about the millage. Yeah. So I know that um, from Ashley and Annie and some others that I've talked to, we as a commission on aging cannot tell people to vote yes. We can educate them. We can say that we've this is how it could help our neighbors and our community. We can say um, that we recommended the Office on Aging, that we recommended considering a senior millage because we saw value in it. These are things that we can say. Really, the thing that's off limits is for us to be like, hi, I'm the commissioner. I'm a commission on aging member, and I think you should vote yes on the senior millage. We cannot do that. Um you can, as just like an individual, encourage people to vote yes. So I was at a pool party in my neighborhood uh, last week and they, one of my neighbors is like, hey, what do you do? And so I'm sharing all these things that I'm involved with. And one of them, we started talking about the senior millage and I was like, this is really going to benefit our community. And like, if if you could, like, they're like, I don't know a lot about this. So I shared a little bit of information, but if you could just vote yes, because in that case, it was just me being a neighbor, being myself. Um, so that's the the separation. You cannot connect yourself as a COA member while telling someone to vote yes. Um, and so we as a commission on aging, things that I'm exploring with um, Ashley is like how to frame a press release this way, um, how to... Well, we're, she's already updating our COA webpage to have information on a senior millage. How much would it cost me um, in my home? How much, what, what would some of the benefits be? Like some high level FAQs, not telling people to vote yes, but if it happened, you know, educationally, this is what we would like you to know about a, what a yes vote would look like. Um, as an individual, I would encourage you to join up with Say Yes for Seniors. They're going to need a lot of help getting the word out there. Um, we're, we were supposed to have a messaging meeting earlier this week and due to uh, scheduling, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't happen. Um, I had hoped it would happen before this meeting so I could give you some messagings to run with. Um, but stay tuned. As soon as we we have it, I'm, I'm working with the Say Yes um, messaging group to just yeah be able to share more with you guys on on what we can say as commission on aging but that's that's sort of the direction that it's going with and i would really encourage you to join up with one of the the subcommittees that say yes to seniors because they could really use the help the other thing i can tell you is that they are um putting together a ballot action committee or campaign coalition. I don't remember what the C stands for, but that will allow them to take in donations and then spend on yard signs and t-shirts, Facebook ads, um, postcards, mailers, things like that to get the word out. Um, and they're working on that. Who Any leads that group? Um, Gary's been leading that group, Gary Munts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Bruce, I see you talking, but you're muted. Elizabeth, I see your hand up, so we'll go to you. Um, it sounds like then if we as individuals want to share more information even than what we, and we do have information about the benefits that we've shared in our letter to the county commissioners and in our past annual reports, it sounds like soon on our website, there's going to be some additional information that we can grab and then as individuals share with all our different groups. And um, I think Jasmine's point about recognizing there are a whole bunch of voters in Washtenaw County and they're not all over age 60 is a very good point. Uh, uh, that I'm going to try to remember. It, it's easy when you advocate for uh, older adults' issues to forget that it isn't an older adult question, just like 
when I used to work for the Women's Commission, we always had to remind people that women's issues are really family issues. Mm -hmm. um, older adult issues really are family issues and community issues and planning for the future issues. That Thank you for raising that point, Jasmine. That That's very powerful. Bruce? Um, I was just going to add, yeah, make sure I'm not muted. I was <laughs> just going to add that to what you were saying, Maria, about the if people do join, um, say yes, they're joining as individuals and not as council members per right. se, because that get into that same dilemma. But, um, and in fact, so, several of the people who represent organizations that may be directly implicated and the millage, um, you know, funding, if it, if it uh, succeeds, um, also have to be, be careful, but there's a lot, as Marie's saying, there's a lot to, that people can do. And, um, so it seems to me that the more we can do to support say yes, the, the better. Anything else on moving forward, future planning? I got an email from Phyllis, just wanted to share um, what her, what she said, getting the information out is a major topic and that we really need to explore how we can get the word out. Um. Yep. Um, Phyllis, go ahead. Are you going to say something? I think she's frozen. Okay. Um. This is more future planning in a slightly uh, different way, but if we're done with the report, I just wanted to add one other thing. Sure. Um, I believe that um. Uh, there was a report shared with people. Taylor sent out a reference to a federal report. There's a second federal, there's a second national report that AARP has also put out that I think would be worth people looking at. They're kind of coming out back to back and they're very helpful in terms of an, a national um, push towards where we need to go on an aging, you know, uh, and a plan for aging for um not just at the federal level. Um, they're they're talking about the importance of building on efforts at the state and local levels. And the report that was shared just came out. It was uh, I talked brief, briefly with Debbie Dingle about it. We we laughed about it. it was uh, a long time coming, but it's it's good to have it. It's a decent, very decent report. I think the AARP report also. I can get a link to Taylor or whatever. But there's a good. Uh, that's a, a useful document as well, and they overlap to a fair degree. But I think what it, the implications are, maybe if, if the millage is successful and some of the resources, as we hope, will go to an office on aging, I think that would be really helpful in terms of thinking about some of the um, priorities and possibilities and strategies of an office for aging that could play off of some of those ideas and um so that's part of the reason why those reports could be helpful at looking at future directions. So just wanted to encourage people to look at uh, those if you have a chance. They're they're lengthy, but they're well organized and well presented. Yeah, that's good. Um, one of the comments that I was going to make from the moving to the moving forward group, and then also as this group to this group as a whole. Thinking ahead a little bit, assuming that this millage, if this millage does pass, then like what's next, right? Well, the county's going to start collecting tax dollars and the county commissioners are going to be the final decision makers on where funds go. And somewhere in, in the middle of theirs, they're going to make the office on aging and, you know, some of those other steps. And so how do we as the Commission on Aging want, what sort of recommendations do we want to make? What, how do we want to advise the Board of Commissioners to consider um, X, Y, and Z in the Office on Aging? How do we want them, you know, how can we advise them? Not that anything we say is going to actually like for sure happen. We're advisors, right? But like, what advice do we want to give around how funds are allocated, where priorities are and things like that. And so that's 
um, where I've been thinking and, and starting to strategize in the last month, ever since they, they said, yes, it can go on the ballot. Um, how do we want to be involved like at that point and getting, you know, keeping this all moving forward. And so that would be something that I would encourage everyone to think about, but specifically the, um, the moving forward um, committee, as you look at the AARP report, as you look at the report that um, Taylor shared from the ACL, um, as we, as you reflect on all of these um, presentations we've had the last few years, uh, the community assessments that Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation has done and the AAA1B now Ageways has done. Um, there's a lot of information out there and I feel like there's some high level trends that are definitely worth the prioritization, but you know, there's, there's other, there's other stuff um, to consider. And so that's where we need to be thinking in the next few months. Yeah, Margie. Um, do we have the uh, Ann Arbor Area Community Foundation report? Yes, it should be on our website. Um, it is on our website. I'm just trying to remember where exactly it is, if it's listed under just a bunch of reports um, or whatnot. I will look that up and, and I'll have Taylor send it out to you guys so you can find it quickly. And so that's the report, the, the strategic planning report. Oh, the most recent strategic plan. That's a really great question because Chris has talked to this group about the current strategic planning that they're doing. Um, he, while it's near final stages or it's like in that final little bit, he's, um, decided to not publicly release it yet. Um, because if we have a millage that changes timelines, it changes, you know, the, the breadth of what can happen, right? If we're working with this amount of money versus that amount of money, like it changes the strategy a little bit. And so he's decided to, to not release it yet. Um, and stay tuned because I'm sure he'll have more information. Um, well, yeah. it, it, it seems to me we need at least pieces of that, maybe not the the dates and timelines and all of that, right. but right. Uh, how can we, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty big piece of information there. Yeah, I can share that the priority areas after all of their community listening and um, strategy sessions, their focus areas were um, transportation, housing, food security. Um, and I don't remember exactly how it was framed, but it was like systems and data, um, looking at like what systems are connecting all of the service providers, how is data being collected? How's it being shared? Um, the idea of the dashboard came back out. And I know that that's a hope for the office on aging to take ownership of, um, should that be there? So those are the high level things, which honestly, when you look at any of the community assessments that have been happening in Washtenaw County the last decade, housing, transportation, and food security are always at the top of the list. Um, yeah. Socialization is often there. And that really got highlighted after, during and after COVID, right? Um, along with technology at the same time. But um, yeah, some of those other areas um, shift around a little bit. Yeah, and and um, yeah, I just I just think it's um, uh, something that we need mm -hmm. if we sit down and look at how we want to proceed or how yeah. what recommendations we want to make, and, right. and truth be told, uh, that's the latest piece of information. Yeah. So we we really need that. Mm -hmm. If you can lead our Yeah, no promises that I get Chris to change his mind, <laughs> but I'll see if he, what pieces of it that he would release to us so we can help in this way. Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so we have the report from the Board of Commissioners and neither Ashley or Annie are here. So we'll skip that one. Um, report from the chair, I already said my bit. Um, I really do encourage you as individuals and anyone who might be listening today or listening on YouTube later, um, say yes to seniors would be the group to join if you would like to advocate for a yes vote. Um, any new business people want to raise? Nope. Great. Uh, Elizabeth. Uh, it just occurred to me, I can't remember when the commissioners begin the um, process of reappointing members to this commission. And when we're we're due to, for them to get that information in so they can vote, so we can get going in January. And um, I might be too early about it, but <laughs> we need to think about that. Yeah. And That's good. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have any additional information. I was hoping to ask Ashley that today at this meeting. I'll just follow up with her via email. Um, but yeah, a lot of people's two year term is coming up. And so people would either be reapplying if you would like to stay in the Commission on Aging, or you would ideally help find your replacement um, if you were not going to apply to be on this commission again. Um, having people kind of nudge solid replacements makes this group a lot stronger. Uh, Bruce. Um, just one last thought on the um, future directions um, sort of task or charge. Um, I think I, I couldn't agree more with what the, you, know, you said earlier, Maria, and, and what people are going to find in the um, report from the Community Foundation. I think those are all critical priorities. I would like us maybe another way we can contribute though is um that's going to leave out a lot of things and not that any one report or any one millage is going to ever be able to solve the full set of, of challenges in front of us but i would like us as a group at least to consider a different way to think about those issues by looking at um this concept of community readiness for aging um because it implies more than just supports and services being available. It has to do with um, political leadership being aligned behind it, both at the city level, the township level, and the county level. And I think that there's a way we can talk about age-friendly, I mean, that comes from AARP, but community mm -hmm. readiness is another kind of trend that Maria, uh, um, Maria alluded to that I think is one worth looking at because it really does talk, I'll just give one quick example. When they talked about, um, this is from another field, but when they talked about children getting ready for school um, and you know, early childhood, the importance of early childhood, they always talked about, you know, this is such a critical period. Um, I did a lot of work in that field at that time. One of the things we realized was we had to make sure that the institutions that were receiving these children, schools and childcare centers and after school programs were ready to receive them in a way that would make the most sense. It's not enough to put the onus on the individuals trying to get them do everything they can do to be well prepared. Uh, receive, you know, the institutions that work with these people, and I think the same analogy holds for older people and older services and things. We need to make sure our communities, our leadership, our budgets are all more ready than they are right now to take on this important task. Otherwise, I think we're gonna run up against some of that same kind of frustration that I feel when we do go um, to legislative day in um, in Lansing and get turned on or we get a, a few crumbs thrown to us. Um, the last thing I would say, and I, I, I think the age waste folks do great work, but just one last comment uh, and then I'll stop. Um, I think that notion that $9 million was too much is not correct. I really think that's that's not enough. 
and we shouldn't be, and I understand the politics of asking and getting rejected and all of that, but if we're not asking for what we really think we need, um, I think we're we're not doing the best job we can. Um, I also noted on her numbers that she presented, and Stephanie and, and Taylor did a great job, but there was some number of 118 million over a 10 year period. Well, that breaks down to about 10 million, $11 million a year. I mean, we're talking about fairly small funds when you've got a multi-billion dollar um, budget um, at the state level. And I think we need to figure out a way to make a case for readiness. And that has to include more significant leadership and budgets. And I think we can be a good voice in doing that. Yeah, thank you. I think what Stephanie was trying to say when when she was talking about the asking for nine million more is realizing that that was going to be a, a a heavy lift for the people that they were advocating for. They were advocating for nine million because that's what they needed, um, <clears throat> but they just also realized that you know they're fighting against a lot of other issues and ask nine million in that case would be um, a lot. I mean, look how long it took us to get. <laughs> to even a potential millage, you know? Um, the other piece that I would, uh, so you talked about the community assessment and like, or I'm, I'm sorry, community readiness. Um, I think that's great stuff to include in the recommendation going forward. The Office on Aging would be equipped to start doing some of that. They would have ideally the, the um, staff people there to make the political conversations happen and make the organizational um, conversations happen to network with the volunteers, right? It's not an overnight thing, but they would, they would, Office on Aging would be equipped to do some of that. And so I think including those things in your recommendations for um, going forward, I think is um, strategic and, and good. Um, Margie. Yeah, um, Bruce, I like that concept of, um, community readiness. And I wonder if there, do you, I guess when I think about that, uh, has a lot to do with attitudes, um, um, knowledge, sharing knowledge and so on. Are there pieces to that process that have been written about or um, because it it's, it's a concept that I think might be valuable to us uh, very early on as we work with say yes to seniors um, and and beyond. So I don't um, know if you have any more information on. I do, I do Margie, and I will be happy to share it with, um, I guess I'll get it to Marie and, uh, and, and or Taylor. And, um, but there are a couple of recent um, reports and some organizational um, work that's been done that I think would be helpful. So I will definitely get that to people. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Awesome. Because my daughter really wants to get to the pool. <laughs> um, our next uh, meeting is September 6th. Um, can we have a, do we need a motion to adjourn? I always forget this. I know we do a thumbs up, but yes, motion to adjourn. I see. So okay. Margie, so moves. Yeah. Second. second. Phyllis is going to second us. Thumbs up. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good weekend. Thanks. You too. Bye.